uh, MBA class of 2018, please join me in welcoming President Paul Kagame. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. I just wanted to express what a privilege it was for me to sit in on the National Leadership Retreat. As you know, the students have been reading a case. They've read it very diligently. Um, and so I wanted to just start off by asking a couple of questions before we allow our students to ask you some questions about leadership, which they've been thinking so much about over the past 20 months. So I wanted to start by asking if you could talk a little bit about the transition from leading a liberation struggle to leading a government. What are some of the similarities and differences and the context between those two things. Well, thank you. I'm definitely happy to join you and this class. And uh, I thought you were going to start by asking me about the World Cup, but, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. We shall start with this one. <laughs> um, liberation struggle and uh, what it entails uh, uh, brings a lot of things together, but uh, in a sort of uh, complex form that um, it's more or less firefighting, if you will. It's dealing with uh, very unpredictable situations. Um, you don't know what to expect uh, every moment uh, as one passes and you enter into another moment. So it's, it's, things are moving so fast, uh, very delicate, um, and on your mind you are preoccupied with the cost of failure, if you uh, don't succeed in you know, making it to another day, the implications of it. Uh, so it's, it's high stakes, it's uh, extreme situations, it's, uh, and everybody's you know, focused, uh, if you will, on um, survival every minute, every hour, every day. And at that moment, you are dealing with what you have before you in the field. Uh, and there are moments when you're not even thinking about next month, next year. You, you just have to go through that moment. But of course, there are other moments you have to be looking at uh, those timelines uh, ahead. Uh, so it's, 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 if you will, then a uh, very difficult situation. So we, we went through that. Um, so the difference, <coughs> and, and doesn't involve as many people uh, as later on when I talk about government, uh, that situation does. Uh, so, from this to government, from the liberation struggle, the complexities of it, the pace at which things are moving, uh, the stakes being very high. Um, so, when you move to government, running a government, uh, it's a little bit more relaxed. In a sense, you have time to think through things, to call upon other people to do their part and step in, and they've got to think about it. Sometimes they act also at a slow pace, but that's okay. Uh, you, you, you can afford to uh, wait until things really are well absorbed by those people playing a part. Uh, but I'm not saying that issues that have to be dealt with, even in government, are not complex. Uh, they are. But the setting in which you do things is different and allows you 
time and gives you possibility to tap into uh, all kinds of resources available uh, and to learn from this or that, uh, not only from within but even from outside. So it, 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 it's more open, gives more possibilities and opportunities. It's a bit slow, it can be frustrating if you uh, still with the mind frame of what it was during the struggle. Uh, so you've got to understand uh, the shift from this to, to the other one and, and, and learn to be patient with things knowing that these are two different situations you are dealing with and uh, therefore the approach might be different. So, but I think it's the, the for my personal experience, I think I have learned a lot from both. And bringing the two experiences together uh, gives one an opportunity to uh, be able to do a lot of things. And uh, with the pleasure in my case, I, I, I feel I've learned a lot from that extreme side of liberation and then uh, later on from uh, being at the center in a more relaxed situation but nonetheless having to deal with even more uh, complex problems as well. Mm. Mm. Excellent, thank you. One of the things that comes across very distinctly, both at the retreat, and I think we've seen it in the case, is the degree to which no detail is too small. You have an incredible focus on details, and yet the government, as you just mentioned, is so complex. It's such a complex way of thinking about things and um, lead, way of leading things. How is it that you came to put such a priority on paying attention to detail, and how do you prepare to manage so many different details across so many different agencies and ministries? Let me explain that by again linking the two situations and the experiences. For example, in the first one, in the liberation days, the individual mattered a lot, whether it was me leading the group or even the individuals in this group, because at different times, different levels, people had tasks to carry out that had uh, certain implications. And uh, I remember in those days of liberation, um, I had to pay attention to details to such an extent as, because in the end, from my experience, uh, what we are dealing with costs lives. Uh, and you see it every day. Uh, so I would be, for example, worried when we, because there was scarcity also, we were having to deal with the scarcity of all kinds of things, even food, medicine, ammunition, and have we communicated the message to, that we needed to communicate, and, uh, and, and, and you know, the situation is not forgiving if you delay even a second or, or a minute. It, it might cost somebody's life. That is one. So I, I would be worried about this. I would go into details to make sure that one soldiers have they eaten in this place, in that situation. What is going on? You know, isn't, uh, for example, one of the leaders, a commander in some place, uh, Hasn't he forgotten to do this? Won't he, you know, be careless? And that's, that means people, lives will be lost, and that means, we, you know, setbacks in our own journey, and, and, and so on and so forth. So we got used to this kind of pace and, and dealing with these details uh, to an extent that you could read that actually it matters to go into these details. The same thing, again, to an extent with the government, you get to understand that even with the government, there are certain objectives that you need to 
uh, reach and goals. And uh, if you fall short, it may delay, it may take a longer time, but the implications of it will be felt down the road uh, by the whole nation, by a section of people, by all kinds of things. So it's good to look at the big picture, uh, but this big picture we talk about is not an empty sort of, you know, thing. It's, it's a big picture that builds on certain layers of details. So if you don't care to and use a lot of time to go to these details, then the big picture just remains in a name. It is just a big picture, but what is it? Uh, so it must relate to results. It must be relating, to, and, and it won't add up until you have uh, taken care of these small details. So one must find time uh, to try and uh, connect with these details at the same time as you keep uh, looking at the bigger picture uh, and, and that's how it moves. I mean, it's, it's when you're dealing with it uh, in your terms, I'm sure everyone has their own situation they have to deal with in that way. Uh, but you really feel it, you experience it, you know that the details matter as they build up to the bigger thing you, you, you want to achieve. Uh, that's what we have attempted to, uh, to do, uh, especially when uh, we bring people to the retreat. It's about, uh, in this case, uh, figuratively, but also it works to really bring people together in the same room and feel each other and know that uh, one depends on the other. Uh, and therefore, a conversation uh, will help uh, to make this a reality uh, so that as a nation, different leaders at different levels contributing to uh, achieve what we want to achieve, uh, really need to come together, need to coordinate, need to communicate with each other. One, not to, one needs to understand that the resources one holds in their hands uh, will be more productive if uh, they come together with uh, what the other one is also holding and, and having to deal with. Um, so th that is, first of all, the essence of the retreat. Uh, but in it, there is this message that cuts across, even without stating it, that we are, we are working for a common goal. We, we need to be talking to each other. We need to, you know, so being in this room of where we have the leadership retreat simply reminds us of, of, of these kinds of things. You have a very facilitative style. Um, one of the things that I've been mentioning to my students is that watching you run the retreat is like watching a professor do a case study or perhaps like a conductor with an orchestra because you ask different people to talk about the same problem. So you'll present a problem um, and then ask lots of different people from different areas of the government to talk about it. Could you talk a little bit about that process and about what you're hoping to show and what you're hoping to get out of that process? Mm. Well, being a professor, uh, uh, somebody conducting an orchestra is, is a little bit more complex, but... Uh, <laughs> In this way, we try to simplify that 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 uh, responsibility or, or, or uh, way of doing things. But you are right. Um, in that room, you see, as I said, in that room you have everybody. Uh, the, the leadership retreat, as you saw, almost all, all leaders, the top leaders, middle, you know ones and uh, in different uh, departments and sectors of uh, government are in the room. So 
One, we try to talk about problems that we have to address. And we are trying to measure whether we understand these common problems the same way, even if we have to tackle them from different angles. Uh, because people are coming from different sectors and maybe at different levels as well. Uh, and therefore, we want to build, as, as Aria discussed, when we are talking about how we should be communicating, coordinating, working together, we want to deal with this bigger picture, if you will, with the details and showing how these details are linked and how uh, they actually build up to this big picture we are looking at. So in the room, we, uh, what one tries to do is to encourage, uh, you, you, you point out the problem, we have a definition of it, and then we go into details asking people who should have contributed to that, uh, what they are thinking at that moment or what they've been thinking at the moment they are elsewhere acting on their own, and encouraging to see that much as they may deal with one part successfully, the other part also has to be running successfully, and, and if they come together, then we all succeed. Uh, this is really what, in that room, uh, other than being specific on, on issues, on questions, on solutions, uh, we, we want to keep demonstrating that uh, solutions are achieved better through this kind of coordination. Thank you very much. So rather than having me ask all the questions, um, I wonder if we could come down and start asking the students um, in more of a classroom setting. So Absolutely. perhaps we can uh, we'll give you a bit of a taste of the National Leadership right. Retreat. If we, yes. Yes, thank you. Sure. <laughs> and so what we'll ask you to do is to raise your hand and I will come over or somebody will come over with a microphone. Just um, doing it in the retreat way. Yes, uh, please, that would be terrific. <laughs> that would be excellent. And this all the follow-up. what follow you do, you step out and uh, Exactly. And f please feel free. You c the students really know their stuff. So any follow-ups that you'd like to ask them, right. I'm sure they'll be pleased. <laughs> All right. Jessica. Um, hello. Thank you for uh, coming to give us this class. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the case was a very strong sense of building a culture of accountability and being very results-oriented. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more to us about what were the kind of key things that you did to really build that culture of accountability um, amongst your team? Yeah. Well, it, it starts with making sure that indeed everybody understands that uh, we are working, working towards certain goals. And in that process, uh, the best, so therefore the eyes must be on the results. Uh, but there is a journey to, to reach that point. And in that journey, many things are at play, as we said earlier. Um, whether it's uh, money that uh, has to be spent, or it is time, or it is um, uh, the people that have got to be involved. So accountability suggests that all of these things must be coming together in a certain way that will actually take us through the journey to the point we want to be at. Otherwise, if you don't, if uh, everyone pulls in a different direction, if the resources are spent just as every individual wishes uh, or thinks they should spend the resources without bearing in mind the consequences of that or how they should be working with the others, then you know you won't get the result to the results easily or you won't go to the 
you won't achieve the goals very easily. So that's, that's why, and, and, and this sort of thing we have to do, I'm, I'm sure it's in the business, it's in the government, it's wherever. Uh, we, we are driven to achieve something. We are, we are dealing with certain problems, we are looking for solutions. Uh, therefore, that suggests you want to see a difference from where you started from and to where you want to be. And, and I don't think of any other way we can uh, get to where I want to be without we are accounting for the steps in the whole process uh, and, and without keeping you know, your eyes uh, on the end result, which would mean the goals you want to achieve. Uh, so the two are very closely linked, and uh, I, I don't see any other. And, and that makes the difference, uh, how you manage this whole process and whether you get the results you want or not. As um, we went through the case study, uh, we saw some of the economic numbers um, that were benchmarked against what was expected um, by the year 2020. And some of these numbers were looking quite good. In fact, the majority uh, were quite good. Um, and then recently, we saw in the papers and in the news how um, Rwanda has opened up a factory uh, where Volkswagen will now be um, building several lines of, of their cars. So I guess my question is, as president, how, how micro do you get? How detailed are you in the execution and the planning of all of these things? Do you go down to detail or do you let those who you have assigned do this and then report back to you? Um, I actually do both. I think it is safer to do both <laughs> because uh, first of all, it doesn't serve well anyone if you, and by the way, that means everyone at every level has their responsibility. I have a responsibility for which I also want to be accountable. So this means how do I wait and assume that everybody is doing what they are doing right and I'm just waiting for good results? And then in the end, actually, they are not good results. And yet, I have to answer for that. Somebody will come and ask, I said, President, what went wrong? I'm always afraid of saying, I don't know. <laughs> what <went wrong. laughs> I want to be having an idea of what actually went wrong. <laughs> um, it could be that what went wrong is with all of us, starting from below up to me, including me, that maybe something actually went wrong. Still, I should be able to explain that and say, you know what, I think we screwed up. And we need to get things right next time. And this is where it started from. So that, 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 that's what urges me to say, be as detailed to go to the minute details as, as much as you can. We do what is possible anyway. Uh, uh, so, but at the same time, as, as you do that, you want to create space also so that those who are responsible actually do it. Uh, now, this is a, so it depends on, on the management of it. Sometimes, uh, let me explain what I do a little bit. We, we start by having a conversation with different levels of responsibility, leaders, and say, you know what? We're going to have this thing. This may be a good thing for us. So we can go back and forth talking about what we need to have, what we need to do, and so on and so forth. So we agree. So when we part ways and uh, each one goes to the area of responsibilities, of course, the initial assumption is Everybody understands what they need to do, and let's go and do it. But after some time, you want to check 
whether that is true. And my experience is, in many cases, that has not been true. You'll find people who you agreed, they, everybody understood, we are going to do this. Actually, let me use just a random number, maybe 50%, actually either did the wrong thing or just went and did nothing and got diverted into other things and so on and so forth. So you know that is going to reflect in the outcomes. There's no question about it. It's the reality. So, but if you have some time to go back and check, are we okay? Sometimes I even call, place calls, telephone calls. I call somebody, I say, are we fine? Are we still on, uh, you know, agreed on what we needs to be done? Is things going fine? Then if they assure me, that's a big step. But I'll go back another time to see whether the call was actually telling me the truth. <laughs> yes, because somebody may say everything is fine <laughs> when things are actually not fine. <laughs> but first, say, placing a call and asking is a gentle reminder, uh, but also creates a space for the other one. I have reminded, but I have also created a space because I didn't go there physically. Find out. So it's a reminder, but I leave it to you. So next time I'll find maybe time, depending of course always on the uh, importance or the urgency of what we are having to deal with. I don't want to go into everything or every time. It's, it's, there are priorities also. There are certain things I can't afford to have them go wrong. So then this time I may show up physically and say, okay, let's go through details and see if things are fine on top of the call. Now, this is a, a bit strong reminder, uh, stronger than the call. Uh, and I have found that this helps. And in fact, when you've done it over time, you'll find in a certain situation, maybe you don't need to go back in the future for other things. They start going into self-drive. These leaders start doing things, uh, maybe flawlessly, and uh, because of that experience we had. But again, in some cases, it is a, a continuous ex, you know, experience. You have to keep going back and forth. The amount of frustration there is in the government, I'm sure you, <laughs> maybe one day you, some of you will experience it, but uh, there's when you keep asking, say, but we agreed so many times. That this, is, this is even the way you said you understood it yourself. This is the way you said you need, wanted to do it, and we agreed, but why didn't you do it? What is the explanation? And somebody says, oh, no, no. The only explanation is, oh, I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> apologies. <and> uh, <laughs> but apology is fine, but the issue is the results are not there, and that's what you wanted. So, and it happens today, tomorrow, another day, then another. But so, we have to keep going. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we'll have David on this side. And David, if you could please introduce yourself and tell us which country you come from. Your Excellency, we have 16, we have 16 different African countries, actually countries in Africa and beyond represented right. here. So we thought the students should tell you. Mm -hmm. Okay, David is my name. I come from Kenya, but uh, I live and work in Rwanda. I've been here for the last eight years. Good. Um, and my question is um, around well, driving just through the, the, the villages here and uh, mostly in Gishumbi the other day, there was a Gumaguma show that had just happened in the, in the stadium. I was driving th through this crowd of youths and uh, the striking thing about them is that um, they were mostly within the edge of, I would say, 15 to 20 uh, or thereabout. Now for me, this is both an opportunity and a threat because the question is in the next three, five, ten years, what do we do 
with all this uh, army of people. Uh, this is uh, just one sector of Rwanda. I'm sure if you go to Muhanga, it would be the same thing. If you go to Ruhenjeri and Rubavu, it would be the same thing. How do we turn this threat into an opportunity for us in Africa, and specifically for you in, in, in Rwanda as the president? What's your plan with all this? And the second part of, of, of the question is actually related to what Peter just mentioned, is around, again, the involvement in the details. Now, you as the chairperson of, of the African Union at the moment, I would imagine that uh, the, the, the problems or the challenges that you face are not only in Rwanda at the moment, but also uh, Africa-sized problems. Um, and for me and for all the people who are in this room, I would imagine also have families. How do you balance uh, these things? Does this mean that it's longer sleepless nights for you? Or how, how do you draw the balance of uh, getting involved in the details and your family, personal life, and ensuring that all of them are on track. Thank you. Well, I promise you it keeps getting better. <laughs> for, for me, uh, with more people uh, graduating as you are going to, and um, so people actually have been uh, taking over certain responsibilities and therefore others doing what is right and what needs to be done, so that even the level of getting into details also uh, decreases and, uh, you know, so it, I'm glad. Then for, uh, uh, by the way, let me not skip the, the point of balancing with increased numbers of people who are being educated, who are acquiring skills, who are taking you know, uh, responsibility for themselves and for the nation. Maybe not to the level we all want, but nonetheless is uh, good progress. Uh, alongside that, as even where we started from, um, we uh, find few times when we can uh, be with our families. In fact, we are with our families most of the time, but not as much as we want. So we, we, for dealing with the families, it's a question of uh, knowing and how to manage it. And being, sometimes they come to you, sometimes you go to them. and So there is always time for that. Uh, even in way back when things were still very uh, uh, even more complicated. We still, once maybe in a year, we used to find time for, for families. So that, not as much as we wanted, but, but it happened. Um, so for the young people who, who are coming up, uh, the numbers, of course, when you look at them, people under 30 or the numbers alone of people who were born in the last uh, 24 years uh, since the liberation of the country, uh, they tell a story, a good one, but also uh, uh, one needs to be cautious about that. As you rightly said, this is a big resource, this is an opportunity, but it can be a big problem uh, to manage. Uh, so depends on how we invest in our people, it depends on uh, how we encourage them, you know, to be able to do things uh, for and by themselves uh, as much as they can. I'm sure that's what you spent very much time on. You, you are trying to, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, you want to be, you know, even if you are employed in the public service or wherever, uh, it's, it's, there are lots of spaces that can absorb people um, and, and stop that being a, a big threat. 
And of course, this conversation has gone across the continent. We are always talking about that. And some countries uh, ahead of others in this, but there's no one who is ahead of the other to the extent that they can say they have no problem. No, there is still, even when you are doing well, there is always this problem that is uh, uh, waiting uh, in this area you have just specified. But all of you here, as you graduate, I'm sure you are having that in mind. So I'm sure you leave this place uh, as leaders also who are going to address some of these challenges in your different uh, areas where, where, where you will be or different countries. Um, so it's a problem that will continue to be there. It's a problem we we'll have to continue trying to address. Uh, there is no point at which we say everything is OK, no more, nothing to worry about. But just having to worry about what needs to be done uh, every day so that you at least make a, a big dent in this problem. Matthew. Thank you again for coming to speak with us. My name is Matthew Grolnick. Uh, I represent the United States and Zambia, though I live in Kenya. Uh, <laughs> um, my question for you is about the relationships that you have with other senior government officials. Um, you described a little bit about the way that you manage them, the way that you interact with them. <coughs> I'm curious um, what type of relationship you try to create with them. Um, is it a relationship of coaching? Is it a relationship of enforcing, uh, managing? Is, is it a father-like type of relationship? What, you, what do you try to build with them? And I think also equally important is what type of relationship do you not try to create with them? Mm. Let, let, let me start even uh, in my own home with my children. I have a relationship with my children as their father, and of course with the mother. We work together to try and... Uh, so we are constantly having a conversation about life, about uh, the world we live in, about politics, if you will, about all kinds of things. And about values, about culture. We, we spend a lot of time doing that. The, what we are trying to do is to instill in them being conscious of these things as they grow up. But we're also careful in making sure that in the end, they grow up in their own way. They, they are able to realize themselves as they want. But we, we have the responsibility to keep saying, you know, some of these things, be careful. We always be on the good side of uh, this behavior, the law, things like that. Generally, it's like you always have to be, whatever you are doing, whatever your passions are, whatever your talents, whatever you wish to do, take care of these things, be careful about these things. But in the end, they do it in their own ways. They grow. So they have their own responsibilities. So in the government, other officials, it's about what are we here for? Officials of government, or people working you know, together for different things. What are we here for? Therefore, in this work we are doing, there are certain do, do's and don'ts. As we know that uh, for a long time, for even other places, and so on and so forth. So, but at the same time, so, and, and then we, there are things, agreed things generally, is what we want, want to achieve. This is our vision. These are things we want to achieve in, for the nation, for our people, and so on and so forth. And you keep insisting on that, certain, talking about certain limits. For example, you are in the government. 
are in a, a cabinet ministry. You are leading it. You're leading people, you are having resources, resources to spend, but ultimately what you are trying to do is for the people of this country. Therefore, if you took the resources and made them your own, you are not doing the right thing. These resources are for you to manage on behalf of the people of this country. So we go through this every day almost. In the cabinet <laughs> is a period of just a conversation, <laughs> conversation. And then the other time is for details of the work we have to do. So the relationship, therefore, is that where we are working together for the common good. We want to deliver. There is accountability. There is responsibility. Uh, I'm not expected to just be very nice to you all the time and say, you know, even when you make a mistake, you know, you're sorry for making the mistake, you know. <laughs> I think next time, you know, no, we don't do that. Sometimes we, uh, we, 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 we deal with the hard stuff, the things that uh, somebody may be, be uncomfortable about. But for a reason, we have just to make sure that if I relate to you for this moment in a hard way, it's not because of any Know, I don't like you, or this, no. It's because the issues we are dealing, having to deal with demand that, you see? But there are other moments when we, like uh, recently on the 4th of July, it's uh, Liberation Day, we, uh, we do different things across the country, we give speeches, sometimes very strong speeches, and then by the evening, we gather in this room and dance and feel happy, and that, that's the thing. But when it comes to work, it's work. Then we have to tell each other the honest truth and, and say, I have no issues with you. The, the behavior in this relationship of how we relate with each other as officials is that Things are okay, very fine, until you do the wrong thing in terms of the responsibility you carry for this country, then uh, certain things have, again, bearing in mind the accountability process and also the responsibility you carry on behalf of the millions of people. So it's, it's, uh, it's good. It's not so good sometimes. Then. So we keep going. But at least the most important thing is for us to get used uh, to the fact that really there are no hard feelings between us uh, except uh, these hiccups that come when you have to deliver on the expectations of our people. Thank you. Mm. Isaac. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my name is uh, Isaac Afriye, and I uh, bring you greetings from Ghana. Good. Um, you. Let me first congratulate you on your leadership, not only in Rwanda, but on the continent of Africa. Um, 25th May was AU Day, and um, I was a bit sad to know that even in the city of Accra, there were still people who did not know what really that holiday was, because in Ghana it's a holiday, national holiday. I know there's a reform, ongoing reform process. And I'm one person who thinks that working AU through the government have failed over the years because the government themselves have failed the people continuously. I don't know what plans you have in this reform process to get down to the masses without necessary. Of course, you cannot go around the government, but is there other channels that you think or you are doing to get to the people? Because we have Agenda 2063, the African we want. I've asked a number of my friends whether they ever made any input. And it's like, no. So who determined the Africa we want for us? That is a key question. The last one is just a suggestion. I mean, over the 22 months, we have been here not just learning about leadership, 
But more importantly, you have seen what good leadership can achieve. So in case there are rules for leaders, young blood, to bring fresh perspective into the AU, look no further. In this room are people who are capable yeah, yeah, yeah. of it. <laughs> yes. Uh, then you have actually answered the part of your question. <laughs> Uh, because uh, if, if I need to uh, communicate with the citizens of our continent uh, to contribute to uh, the Africa we want, I have you to communicate through and with, and uh, the message goes. So I think that's part of the whole thing. But that, that, that's very true. Sometimes. Uh, we leaders uh, at that level were well, really well-meaning, trying to do our best to make sure that we do what is best for, for our continent. We have sat in the room, discussed and agreed, and well, some uh, communicate this with uh, their people and uh, generate buy-in from the population, maybe they make contribution to that or learn about it and feel happy about it. Uh, but it is not done to the extent we all would be happy about. So that there is, there is a job to be done in that area, there is no doubt about it, to find ways of making sure that the reforms uh, <coughs> that are being carried out or that are needed to be carried out in our continent. Uh, first of all, they are based on the understanding and ideas uh, of a broad uh, part of our society on the continent. Uh, so we need to do as much as we can uh, in that. And, and I think building on all of you and uh, uh, others, I think we can do better. There is there is much room uh, for improvement. There is no question about it. So it's it's a valid point. But I think it's 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 better that we get started and get moving, uh, even if one may criticize that there isn't sufficient buying, rather than not moving and wait for sufficient buying, which may never come. So, but you, you, you build on one step, uh, followed by another and another, and then we can make good progress. Yes. Right. Thank you very much, sir. I'm Akitsoye from Nigeria. And now, reading through this case, um, one thing that struck me was the fact that everybody in that room shared the vision, right? They aligned to the vision. And for me in Nigeria, that's something big. And I wonder down to your days during the liberation struggle, and even now, how were you able to build a critical mass to buy into that vision, to share the vision you had for the country? Mm. Thank you. Good. You know, theoretically it is understandable. One can explain almost everything. When it comes to the real practice, Uh, it also depends on uh, the choices we make. Even in this room, all of you having been together, sharing all kinds of ideas. and In the end, when it comes to doing the very things that give us what we want and agreed is the way to go, it's not going to be the same. Uh, and I cannot very easily explain that because it's about choices, it's about understanding what uh, the costs are in not doing the things we, some look at it the real way, others uh, abandon that and start just looking at themselves in it and what they have in it and what the other one has who cares, and, and so on and so forth. So, but in our case, from the liberation days, uh, 
uh, when we understood what the problem was uh, and people got together, young people took up arms, the old ones who were still in the refugee camps in different parts of this region and beyond, and uh, the others who were, uh, everyone rallied and started contributing whatever they had. Uh, even the poorest contributed something. Uh, you know, somebody used to be, uh, an ordinary person would say, you know, come, uh, uh, I'm going to sell my chicken. What I get from it, I'll give it to you. You would think it means nothing, but it is loaded because it's not just this amount. It's, it means this person is invested, is behind it. Uh, I'll tell you a sad story in a sense, but which uh, means a lot. We, we had uh, a family during the liberation struggle when you know, the situation was really very tough. Uh, a family had uh, three children, uh, young uh, fighters with us, boys, and in a certain period, uh, all of them were killed in battles. And uh, so at a certain point, news was sent to the parents uh, that their three sons had died. And there was uh, another uh, brother of theirs who had stayed with the parents. And the parents uh, had cows and uh, this young man in a refugee camp in Uganda. And when the news came, the father waited until the son uh, came back, he was out grazing cattle, and when he comes back, he says, you young man, uh, do you know that, uh, have you heard that your brothers are all gone? They, are, they, are, they passed away. Uh, and then he said, you know, don't worry. I will now, from now, take care of the cows. You go where your brothers died. Go and fight with the rest. And the father sent, so this contribution, this commitment is, is something you, you can't teach uh, anyone. It's, it's, it's I, this why I'm saying I can't explain it, yes. So, but therefore, even with the leaders, you have uh, leaders who are committed, who are attached to the, the cause of leadership and delivering uh, what they have to uh, for their people. And there are others who will choose to say, well, as long as I'm, as long as I'm okay, <laughs> everybody else is okay. <laughs> I'll take care of myself, and, and that's it. So I really can't explain it, but uh, in any case, there are and there have to be uh, people who step away just for a moment from their own specific interests, which will always be there, and legitimately so. I have no complaint about that. But also say, no, but what is good for me is also good for many others. What can I do uh, about it? What can I contribute? So that, because when the others are okay, I'm actually better off. Uh, it's much better than if you are okay just uh, looking at yourself and nothing else. So this makes a big difference in leadership or in politics or in running affairs of uh, any nation. Absolutely. So the more, so if you will, in our case, that struggle that we went through, that I know there are many other countries that have gone through different struggles or similar ones. Well, in some cases they can be wasted. <laughs> you, you, you can have this experience wasted and maybe you don't draw lessons from it. Or, 
But in other cases, it will really build cohesion, it will build uh, you know, being realistic about life, about how to do things, about you know, feeling for the situation and the people and what you have to do uh, so that we, 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 we go or move forward together. Uh, and, and it is possible in every situation that we can think of. It's possible. It's possible in my country, in your country, in other people's country. Uh, but I can't say, give you for sure that uh, you just need to do this and this and this and everything will happen. No, <laughs> it's hard to explain. Yeah. Mm. Hello, Mr. President. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Reading through the case, I was very, very inspired by the very deliberate leadership that you have set out for Rwanda. So my question is around the women in government. 40%, uh, seventh in the world with that. What is the mindset that is required to bring women to the table as equals in a culture where leadership has been male-dominated. Mm. What? Who? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm from Kenya. Good. Well, you, you see, it doesn't start with the women. It starts with everybody. If you are saying, how do we get everybody? realizing their aspirations, their dreams, and contributing and participating. How? Start with that. Then as you go forward, it's like, wait a minute. But how can we go forward, all of us, when women have been treated like this? So if we are talking about everybody, everybody should involve women. So, then you need to address the problem of women. So you can't be talking about everybody and then you have women left behind. Uh, and that's how it gets started to say, yes, women, whatever uh, differentiation you want to make in a society and say men and women, they are like this, they can do things differently, they are a bit different. Still, do it in the context of trying to say everybody must be here, must be contributing. And then you can deal with the specific uh, situations like that. So the mindset, therefore, is that of starting with everybody. Then do we really mean everybody? And if we mean everybody, how come we live behind women? Then you start addressing specific things that can bring them to the same level with everybody. Uh, and that's what we have tried to do. I, I quickly give you an example. We have try, been trying to do, and, and we, again, it's not just numbers. We don't want to impress anybody with the numbers. The numbers are good, but they must be real. They must be based on something real. Uh, meaning, therefore, uh, it's, it's rights also. It's rights of women, like with everybody. It's their contribution. 52% um, of our country of our population, being women. I mean, one must be really foolish <laughs> to just say you, can, you exclude 52% so exclude of your population, and then you say we are fine. No. <laughs> it doesn't need much thinking. It's straightforward. And then when you think in terms of rights, women having rights. And, and therefore, we have looked at this, even in our laws. For example, we, in this country, we inherited laws, uh, colonial laws, 
that actually excluded uh, women from many things. They couldn't inherit, they couldn't, uh, you know, there are many things they wouldn't do as, uh, as of the law. And uh, so we said, no, this needs to change. And we changed that. Uh, but I think women also contributed a great deal to changing that because they dominated the parliament. And I actually used to tell the women, I say, do you women dominate the parliament for nothing? Can't you, you, you need to use that power you have to address some of the things that uh, have created these disadvantages for you. And the, the beauty of it is not that uh, you are just uh, standing aside as women and doing it. You are together with men, but why not use the power of uh, now the numbers in the parliament to address what needs to be addressed? And we've seen so the, the, the mindset, but also needs, you see, with the leadership, it matters how you, you, you communicate. The, 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 there are constant conversations with, with our people, and we are talking about these issues and many other issues. Uh, we put them in public. Uh, there is, including those things that divided our society, our society historically, uh, for many years. You know, this versus that, meaning within us. And you say, wait, wait a minute, let's look at the, the merits or the basis of it. What is it that actually <coughs> brought this country to where uh, it came to be uh, 24 years ago? Or, uh, you know, wh what is it? The divided society. See, this now has nothing to do with men or women. It's the whole society. And then we go into details. So what is it that it divided us? Why? What, who benefited? And then realistically we find nobody benefited. <laughs> In the end we just, uh, you know, all of us were hit by the tragedy. It doesn't matter, by the way. You heard of genocide that took place here. Beat the one, I mean, even the ones who carried it out. There's not a single one who can stand up and say, I benefited this. Oh, everybody actually was a loser. So why, why, why would you get involved in this type of nonsense? Uh, so sometimes politics is built on uh, these realities that we have to confront and address uh, in a very realistic way. So the same thing as for women, for us, we are capable of, uh, and to convince ourselves, we are capable of changing things here in our country. We may not change things elsewhere because we have no <laughs> possibility, and maybe it's not even our, 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 our responsibility at all, but except contributing to it maybe from a distance when we can, or called upon, or because of the connections we have with, with the rest of the world, through that you can make a contribution. But here, we think we can make that difference for ourselves, and uh, we start with ourselves before we go anywhere else. Your Excellency, perhaps we can take one more question for time. Sure. I have this whole morning for you, so. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. My name is Marilyn, I'm from Nigeria. And just because I have share of voice, I want to say it's such a privilege to be in this room with you. It's such an honor, and I think it's for all of us. Now, in our MBA, they taught us one of the most powerful things we've done is they taught us a concept called V3 leadership. And it's the leadership Africa needs. Now, it's, when they say V3, it means three um, embodiments. A leader who has the virtue, which speaks more to the moral compass. A leader who has a powerful vision that is transformative. And then a leader who can create value for so many. And so it's an honor to be standing in front of the embodiment of a V3 leader. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being generous with me. <laughs> now, uh, for my question, another thing they taught us about is system thinking, 
which says that even when you see an outcome, there's usually a lot that has gone in, and it's only by tracing it to the roots that you can find where the outcome has come from. Now we look at Kigali, and what has happened here is phenomenal. I came in this morning with my husband and I said, welcome to my Kigali. Mm -hmm. And I'm a Nigerian. So. <laughs> and it is Nigerian, you are right. <laughs> and um, so I want to ask you, and just giving us like a formula, because there's so much that has been done. If you were going to tell us the three to maximum five most critical things that can be, bring about a transformation in Africa, what would they be for you? Wow. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very hard one. But um, I think some of the things were talked about. All of us in this room and uh, outside, what do we live for? I think everybody has something in mind, says, they want to realize for themselves, for their families, for their societies. So how, as you keep rolling this in your mind, you're trying to say, what can I do about it? What can I contribute? And you should imagine that it is happening to everybody. They are, they are trying to grapple with this problem maybe differently. Well, there are those who maybe haven't given time or for different reasons and just live day by day without figuring out. But I, I, the most majority definitely have this in their mind. So let's say start with this Kigali, which you mentioned. 24 years ago, Maybe those who have who passed here who visited this country. This was a dead city in a dead country. You know, there is a film that was shot by some people, I think sponsored by the UN. And in the end, it was so embarrassing, the UN has kind of disown it or even change the title. It was called, maybe you saw it, it was called Shooting Dogs. Shooting Dogs was depicting, it was actually showing in some reality, how in 1994, uh, there were so many dead bodies across the city and the country, and there were dogs just, you know, eating people's bodies and putting them, you know, whatever. It was, this was the situation. So shooting dogs was, uh, in a way, depicting the UN in a bad light because the UN forces that failed to protect people at the time they, that was needed, they were busy here shooting dogs uh, so that they don't eat the dead bodies. <laughs> So in other words, someone was saying, you know, this became now the mission of the UN to just <laughs> to shoot dogs <laughs> that were eating people on the streets instead of uh, fighting those people who were killing people. So they stopped the killings. That became this one. So this is what it was. But when that was all over and kind of behind us, we started saying, but this city can be a real city and of people. Uh, and we started building on uh, another time, there's a quick story I want to tell you. Um, late Mwarimu uh, Nyerere, the president of, uh, former president of Tanzania, he visited this country in 1995. That was shortly before the genocide. And I went to see him in his hotel room. He was in Mill Korean. And I found him completely depressed. But, you know, after I'd seen all things and heard stories and 
who are stay, standing out there on the veranda of the hotel, Miracle Inn, looking out there. And then uh, when I arrived, he said, the president, uh, then I was vice president. He said, uh, you know, I can't understand. Uh, you Rwandese, you know, I, I was here watching people pass by and I didn't realize that uh, some of you, uh, your people can even afford a smile. That he was watching <coughs> people on the street, young people, you know, greeting each other, embracing and, you know, holding each other and smiling. He says, you mean you can, people, things that, like this that have happened to you, you can have your people even afford a smile. Said, but I was wondering if you scratched beneath their skin, what you would, would actually find. Must be the smile and then, but below it must be. So this is how the situation, but why I'm pointing that out is that story of the film and then this uh, story, I was trying to say, if, yes, if these people could afford a smile at that time, maybe these are also people that could build a beautiful city, a clean city, and keep relegating this sort of situation far behind us. So that's how, where we started from. I said, we can do it. And there are I remember uh, several years ago when we, we started this uh, uh, Umuganda and cleaning up, you know, uh, I, I, I used to uh, tease our cabinet members and, and we say, look, even as of old, we used to have uh, parents, our grandparents and so on, they, they would just do cleaning up in their homesteads. You'd go to a village, you'd go to a poor home and find they've been sweeping and they've been making something clean or building something. I said, we certainly can do that. It doesn't need the donor's money. It doesn't need the money <laughs> uh, from anywhere to achieve that. We can do it. We have it within us. So why don't we just remove these plastic bags and everything. And we started doing it. Initially, of course, there is pushing back. People will say, what, what is this? this? This man also, you know, telling us to clean up. So sometimes I used to, just for demonstration purpose, and even provocative, uh, I would be moving across the city, uh, these convoys of these leaders, and uh, so when I see some dirt, you know, I'm irritated, I stop the convoy and get out and pick this nonsense and give it to my escorts and say, you put it somewhere in a heap, then people will come and clean it up. You know, People passing who would see me do that, it's like the others, the others would be interested in just coming to see the president. Oh, this is, why has he stopped the convoy? Why is he still going to? And then they see me pick this thing. You know, quickly it was catching up. People wanted not to just leave the litter around because I had seen the president do it as well. But we kept building the story on that uh, and many other things. But that quickly shifted to the real things of, you know, how do we build infrastructure? Of course, the problem is always going to be the resources to invest. We struggle to try and find these resources. <laughs> Some of it from within our own means, others from uh, the investors that want to invest, others from, you know, all kinds of sources. But bearing in mind, we want to create something. We want from this tragic history, 
to create a better, to write a better story for ourselves. And knowing that it is possible, especially as we succeed in for one thing, it demonstrated we could succeed in another, demonstrated we could take another step forward, and so on and so forth. That's how we, and the mentality therefore keeps building up. Say, oh, so we can do something. What is it that we want that makes us feel good? That actually compensates for the very bad name we have had in our history of being hopeless, helpless, people who killed each other. We change the whole narrative by these small things that we concentrated on doing that after all were possible within our means. Some of these things you don't need to look elsewhere, you don't need to go anywhere, you don't, they are just in you and, and, and good students, uh, of MBA and just always don't jump to saying, no, it's not possible, or I need to go somewhere else to ask for this. Start by asking yourself these hard questions. Isn't it possible with me? Isn't it possible with us? Well, do we need it or not? If you find you need it, then Look for how to do it. And it's all going, you will start seeing doors opening. And it is up to you to know which way to do it. So we, sit, we dealt with the city, we dealt with the rural areas. With, so it's not just the city. It's also our people down there in the rural areas. Absolutely. But it keeps, it takes time, it takes conversation, it takes nudging, it takes even being provocative. Yes, provoke things to happen. It actually sometimes involves fist fights. There's pushing, there's, you know, we must do it. But you must always explain. You must always have examples or results to prove your point. But you see, when we did like this, we go to this. Isn't it something you like? Yes, then you. So simple language, simple things, small things, cumulatively, you keep building up to the point you want. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you.